Well, hello, 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 and welcome. Welcome, guys, to this very special Meet the Miniaturist edition. Say hello in the chat box if you are just joining us. Let me know if you can hear me. Make sure the sound is working. Hi, guys. Welcome. And also, tell me where you are joining from. Love to see where you guys are coming in from. Also, tell me if you are new to uh, one of my Meet the Miniaturist broadcasts. Hi, Central Florida. Hi, Virginia. Hi, Barry. Good to see you. Hi, guys. New York City. Hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hi, Cinda, Barbara. Great to see everybody is joining. We're just going to wait another minute or so before we start. Make sure everybody can join. Definitely say hello if you're just joining in the chat box. Hi, Mary. Good to see you. Hey, Flora. And also let me know. Hi, Joyce. Let me know if you're you're new. You're not. Faith is not new. Welcome back, Faith. Good to see you. All right. All right. We're just going to wait another half a minute. So folks are still joining. We're going to wait another minute. Hi, Cindy. Good to see you. Uh, look at this. I This is like welcome home week. This is awesome. All right. All right, we're gonna make another half a minute and then I'm gonna start with some housekeeping before we bring on our special guests. Um, let me do a little bit of housekeeping. And I know you're still joining. If you're just joining, tell me where you're joining from. Say hello in the chat box. The chat box will be open throughout this session. Please use it to say hello to each other. Make sure you're on talking to everyone so people can see that you are um, chatting with everyone. Um, just a little housekeeping before we believe, be begin, but actually I do want to first start off by saying that um, I do want to take a moment to reflect on this sad day in our history. I'm certainly thinking about the families affected by what happened 21 years ago um, and continue to be affected. Um, may, may those folks who we lost, may their memory be a blessing. So yeah, um, but I wanted to take a moment to, to reflect on that. Um, but thank you um, all for joining this Meet the Miniatures um, web stream live. Um, so a couple of things on housekeeping. If you don't know me, I'm Darren. <laughs> I'm a, uh, an enthusiastic, unapologetic miniaturist. Um, I love that the world of Tiny and I promote it every chance I can get, but I also sell miniatures. And so I do have a sale coming up next weekend. Uh, I'm gonna put a link in the chat box here. This is a link to all of my social media. Follow me there, find out what's going on. So I have an estate sale happening next week. I have a patrons club if you'd like to join and, and um, join the patrons club and, and um, contribute to my efforts as I promote this miniatures world. And uh, I have a, a special event coming up Thursday night, which patrons club members get to attend. You get to attend some of these exclusive events and things like that, which is one of the benefits of being a patron. And then finally, um, uh, I do have some Meet the Miniaturist episodes coming up, so definitely, uh, if you're not already on my mailing list, head over to my website or head into the links that I put into the chat box and sign up for my updates so you are first to know what's going on in my world of miniatures so you can attend my events, know about my sales, and support my efforts. So with that, um, and I do want to remind everybody that the chat box will be open. We're going to be taking uh uh, questions periodically throughout. We may not get to every one of them, but uh, definitely uh, let us know what you're thinking. Um, but with that, I want to say I am thrilled to uh, welcome our guests from the National Museum of Toys and Miniatures in um, in Missouri, in Kansas City, Missouri. I have been to the museum. It is an incredible museum, an extraordinary collection, probably one of the best collections on the planet of tiny treasures. And I'm so excited to have the curatorial team from the museum, Amy McCune, who is the curator of collections, and Dr. Madeline Rislow, senior manager of learning and engagement here to chat with us and take us on a virtual tour of this fabulous museum. And we also have the awesome background help from Becca Boyer, who's the senior development manager. She's gonna be watching out for the chat box and she's gonna be managing a lot of the technology behind the scenes. So definitely, Say hello to those folks, thank them, and um, welcome you guys, because this is going to be such a wonderful treat to get a virtual tour of this fantastic museum and to see some of these beautiful, remarkable treasures and hear in depth more about them. So with that, um, I think we're going to chat with Amy first. Amy's going to tell us a little about herself, and then Madeline will tell, about, tell us about herself, and then we are going to start the tour. 
<laughs> Hi, Amy. <laughs> Hi, Darren. Thank you. Thank you for inviting Yay. us. We're really excited to share the museum. Yay. Uh, yes. Thank so you. I have been at the National Museum of Toys and Miniatures for five years as the curator of collections, uh, which means I'm responsible for the care and management of the collection, uh, but also share interpretive responsibilities with uh, Madeline. Uh, so I, of everybody on the panel, I've actually, I actually have the longest tenure because we've had some turnover in the last couple of years. Um, but I came from another museum where I was the, the director of collections, uh, started my career as a curator. And as I mentioned to you a little bit ago, um, I started my career at the museums at Stony Brook, which is now the Long Island Museum. And they used to have a set of miniature rooms. And one of my first responsibilities was to uh, write an audio tour, if that tells you when that was. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> awesome, awesome, great. And and and, um, Madeline, why don't you, will you tell us about yourself as well? Sure. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. I'm so excited to get to share uh, this our fantastic museum uh, with Darren and with all of you. So appreciate the invitation. Um, I have, unlike Amy, I have a little less experience at the museum. I've been in my position for three and a half months. Uh, but as I was telling uh, Darren right before we started, I've actually been a fan of miniatures and enthusiast for about 20 years. My first visit to the National Museum of Toys and Miniatures was 2003, I believe, if my memory serves me correct. And it is, uh, it is such a thrill to be able to deep dive into the collection. So I'm a trained art historian. Uh, my background, my specialty background is Italian Renaissance. And as you're gonna see, as we go through the tour, we have some fantastic examples of miniature objects that were inspired by that period. And I like to look at both the artistic elements of fine scale miniatures, but also think about them um, historically and what they can really tell us about kind of thinking about a lot of frameworks that we use in art history. And I love kind of uh, the excitement of making the fine scale miniature world more um, accessible and just uh, more bringing more exposure to it because I think there are a lot of audiences that would be excited about it. They just don't know that they'd be excited about it. So yeah. we're going to pull them in um, today and continue to do so. I know we've got a lot of people that have followed the miniature world a lot, um, many, many years on the on the um, uh, on our tour today. But we're going to pull in even more people because everyone needs to know how great uh, this this work is. Yeah, I just want to say we were talking a little bit about um, before this started about how just how great it is the work that you guys are doing to lend the credibility to the miniatures world that it deserves and that people need to see. So thank you guys for what you're doing. Thank you for, you know, for being here and also for having this fabulous, beautiful space where you house these beautiful treasures to show the world just how amazing miniatures are. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. We're the ones that get to go there every day. So <laughs> we like to be able to share it. For sure. Awesome. All right. So we're going to go on a little tour of the museum. Can't wait. I saw a little preview a couple of days ago, so I'm excited to see it actually again. <laughs> can never get enough of miniatures. Um, but yeah, yeah. And, so and before I, we start the video, do you want me to give a little history of the museum very quickly? Oh yeah. oh, perfect. Yes. Um, because that part of the video is very short. Um, yeah. So the museum was founded um, in 1982 by two collectors. Barbara Marshall and Mary Harris Francis. And Barbara Marshall collected miniatures. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of her, if not everybody. Uh, and Mary Harris Francis collected the toys. And the family story is that they got back from a trip that they had been on together, collecting trip, and they were showing the miniatures to Mary Harris's mother. And she said, if you girls buy one more thing, you're gonna have to open a museum. And they looked at each other and said, well, maybe we will. So uh, since 1982, we've had two uh, expansions in 1989 and 2004. And then the museum was closed for 19 months uh, and reopened in August of 2015 with, with new exhibits. So if, you've been, if it's been a long time since you've been to the museum, you need to come back because uh, 2015 was a pretty large change. Wow, okay, awesome, great.
Okay. And I'll just follow up on that element of just kind of thinking about the changes that have come to the museum. Uh, we're doing a lot new, a, a lot of new programming and we're um, launching, we're actually speaking to the, bringing new, new audiences in. Uh, we're launching our K through 12 programming uh, this year. In fact, we're having a tea party uh, next Saturday. Uh, that is an all kids uh, fundraiser that is really gonna get, we hope a lot of excitement from a new generation of potential miniature uh, enthusiasts. And we've got great membership uh, benefits that are rolling out. And we just want to pull in as many people as possible um, into this fantastic world. Yeah, for sure. You got to get them while they're young, get them inspired at an early age. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Darren, I saw a question about whether the, our co-founders are still living. Um, they're unfortunately not. Mary Harris Francis uh, passed away in 2005. Barbara Marshall just passed away last year. Uh, and because her father was the founder of Hallmark, you can actually find a memorial page to her uh, that Hallmark has done. She retired from the museum in 2010. Mm -hmm. Got it. Great. Okay. All right. Wow. Messages are coming through. All right, guys, keep the chat box flowing. We're, we're monitoring them and we'll try to get to all the questions as we, as many of the questions as we can. And I'll just say that if you're, um, since I'm popping in real quick, what you guys can do is there should be an arrow on the left side of your video that you can drag left or right to either increase the size of the speaker's video or increase the size of this video. And so you should all be ready to go. So we're gonna go ahead and hit play, if that's okay, Darren. Sounds great, let's go. <laughs> So this is the outside of the National Museum of Toys and Miniatures, and we've come inside and we're going to be turning around and you'll see the museum store right there and then our admissions counter. So this is where you would come in and this is Michaela, one of our work study students greeting you today. Uh, we're getting a brief glimpse of the toy tisserie, which normally turns. Uh, that was a community based project when the museum was closed for the renovation. So now we're gonna enter our fine scale miniature galleries. And what you see in front of you is our scale display. So these four pieces, the full scale pieces are um, shown in miniature in 112 scale in the display case on the right. And that's how we ha have our visitors understand uh, what fine scale miniatures are. So we're gonna start with um, this harpsichord that was made by Johannes Landman in 2004, he made this as a commission, and but he decided to make two, and he offered Barbara Marshall the right of first refusal on, on the other one. So she, of course, accepted. Um, if you look at the harpsichord, as we're kind of scrolling down on either side of the keyboard are a satyr and a, a mermaid. And then we're gonna talk a little about this carved mermaid. It's all carved out of one piece of wood. The crown was turned on a lathe and then the, the rest of the figure was carved um, by Johannes. All the keys are independently made of ebony and ivory. Uh, the keyboard hinges are handmade. The strings are made of brass and they're 35 thousandths of an inch in diameter and each pin is drilled and threaded. Uh, the, although sound cannot be miniaturized, the harpsichord is fully functional and would make a sound if you were to press a key. In fact, the acquisition included, included a turned wood tuner for the harpsichord. The painting inside the lid depicts the story of a musical contest between Apollo and Marcius who was uh, considered the inventor of flute music. Mm. Uh, the story goes that he found the very first flute that had been crafted but cast away by the goddess Athena. And she had been displeased by the bloating of, che of the cheeks when she played it. So she threw it out. Marcius later then challenged Apollo to a musical contest, but lost when Apollo suggested they play the instruments upside down. Uh, the woods used are Costello boxwood, European boxwood, wood, cherry, and Africa and Buah. Mm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Do we know how long it took him to make this piece? 
you know, I don't know how long it, it took him. And I, I do know he made the two pieces together. Uh, uh, maybe I can look that up at some point later. And, and we did have one quick question, which is, is the picture painted? I'm assuming that is a hand painted. That is a hand painted piece by Johannes, yes. Right. So we're turning to our history of miniatures case, and we're only going to look at one object. Uh, mm -hmm. In this case, it is an, a Windsor rocker, Comeback Windsor rocker by Eric Pearson, who is considered by many people to be one of the first professional uh, miniature makers. This was made in the mid 1950s. And you can see the Comeback style has long vertical spindles with a straight horizontal top. And that way it looks like a hair comb and that's where the name came from. These chairs could be considered the first ergonomic chairs of their time with their shaped seats and their curved backs. Mm -hmm. um, Barbara Marshall discovered Eric Pearson's shop during a business trip to New York City. His shop was located below street level and there was a coal chute that had been turned into a window. And Barbara remembered that she had seen that window for a year before she actually figured out how to go into the shop. Uh, wow. But she became a, a big patron of Eric Pearson and he, both in his shop in New York City and also once he moved upstate. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have 348 works by Pearson in our collection. Wow, wow. So we're backing away a little bit from the history of miniatures case um, and going toward, we're going to be going towards the south side of the gallery. You can see the black and white swan by uh, Jose, Maria Jose Santos and our Russian embassy. But coming into view now is Twin Manors. Hmm. This piece is called Twin Manors because William R. Robertson built two identical houses, one of which is in our collection. Oh. This does not represent a single historic house, uh, but is rather an homage to Georgian architecture from Maine to Virginia. Uh, Robertson spent nine years researching and building this pair of grand houses. The house has 12 main rooms, a central hall and two staircases, a formal one that you'll see in the central hall and a back staircase that is entered off the kitchen. We're gonna, we've seen the second floor now, so we're gonna go down to the first floor. And I wanted to share a little secret that Bill has shared about the house. As we scroll over to the central hall, you'll see the newel post at the base of the grand staircase. And Bill has told us that there's a tiny deed to the house ah. inside that newel post. <laughs> That's great. So this house, the two houses are not furnished identically because Bill Robertson worked with, uh, Barbara Marshall to furnish the house, and many of the furnishings came from the existing collection. If you were to turn the corner around the house, you would see this window where Robertson has intentionally left the lath and plaster uh, exposed so that you can see this is the way the house was constructed. Uh, again, this is kind of something you have to look a little more closely to see in the house. To make the work as authentic as possible, uh, he used wood from trees that was from the original Cherry Hill Plantation, and he ground up 18th century bricks to make to do the brickwork, including this fireplace that you see in the kitchen. You'll see to the left there's a working clock jack, and that would actually turn the spindle, the spit on in the fireplace. And then on the bottom right is another comb back Windsor chair by Eric Pearson. You can see this one doesn't have the extended comb to it. Hmm. We're walking towards Be Boston Beacon Hill, which was done by Frank Matter in 148 scale. When we acquired the house, Bill Robertson renovated it and discovered a real treasure trove of unbelievable craftsmanship including a functional teapot the size of a pencil eraser and this tall case clock that ran on the world's smallest mechanical watch movement at the time. And I don't know if there's been one that's been made since that's smaller. Uh, probably not because we've gone so digital. Uh, this was commissioned by Claire Bagley Hammonds 
and she described the house as an attempt to reproduce in miniature outstanding features of some of the beautiful old mansions of New England. Her family was from Massachusetts, so you can see some portraits in the house, and those are actually uh, Claire Bagley Hammond's family members that are portrayed in the house. That's great. Uh, most of the silk petty point rugs are made by Ethel Forbes Harding, but also Mrs. Hammond's made some rugs using the French knot technique to look like hooked rugs. Specific rooms are based on different houses. For example, this second floor bedroom is based on one by Samuel McIntyre for Captain Nathaniel West. Um, and as we go down uh, to the first floor in a second, uh, the dining room is the from the first Harrison Gray Ho Otis house in Boston. And the lower hall and staircase are from the John Pierce home in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, as part of the restoration project, Nell Corkin refreshed and enhanced the table arrangements and the garden flowers. The museum acquired the work from Mrs. Hammond's niece, who shared that the house had its own traveling case that looked much like a sewing machine case where it had a base and then a top went over it. And she had that so she could travel with the, the uh, house on the train. Uh, so she did share this with a lot of people during the time she owned it. That's crazy. <laughs> Amy, can you take a second just to tell us, you know, I mean, I'm looking at this as what, 148th scale? Yes. The level of difficulty just to create 112th, but then you're moving down to this smaller scale and it's looking just incredible. Like, I mean, just talk, can you tell us just the level of difficulty to create in that scale? Well, I wish I could tell you the level of difficulty. I had my first experience making miniatures at Guild School this year, uh -huh. and I made miniature books um, with Tina Krynan, and it was great fun. Uh -huh. um, this this would just be an incredible thing to do. And if you think about some of our pieces are even one one forty four scale, for example, all of the work that we have by Nell Corkin. Uh -huh. um, so I can't, unfortunately, as the curator of collections, I can't necessarily uh understand exactly how they can do things that are that intricate yeah but it sounds like you got to see it firsthand just how difficult it was work, working in 12 scale could you imagine making those books even smaller <laughs> i cannot <laughs> they were small enough so benny has a question and it is it's gone oh no when the house traveled as the furniture was it packed away was everything glued down or does everything come out I believe a lot of it, I think it was glued down, um, but it was but it was in a condition when the museum acquired it that it really needed extensive conservation. Um, I don't, I've never seen pictures of what it looked like at that time, but um, she, oh, William Robertson says it was all glued, was glued down glued and he did down. the conservation, so he's gonna know. Wow, that's so scary. Okay. Thanks, Bill, for being on, on the call. <laughs> Everything is glued down. <laughs> wow, wow. Okay, awesome, awesome. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing the difference between the 12 scale and the and the smaller scale because it's it's hard for people to, to actually see. Right. Um, but yeah, that's great. I'm gonna actually turn it over to Madeline for the next section. Before. Yeah, so we're actually traveling around kind of back to the entrance um, of the galleries for the fine scale miniatures again. And we're gonna look at my favorite piece. I love this work. It's a, a box room. It's about 15 by 13 inches. We're going back to 112th scale though. It's mm. not the 148th. Uh, so, um, but still challenging, right? Um, so this is a work that was done by four different artists. Barry Hipwell did the walls that are there in Tarsia inlaid wood. Um, Ursula Derby Skovstad did the ceiling, which is coffered and has gold on it, which is just, I always love to think about like the, I mean, the lighting in all of these spaces, you think about the reflection and everything. Um, Nick Stowe did the floor and then Johannes Landman, who we've already talked about, Amy talked a little bit about him with the harpsichord, um, actually did the paintings on the wall. And I love this because this is, it is an Italian Renaissance, um, inspiration piece, the Studio Logubio. Um, Barbara Marshall actually commissioned it in 2004. And like what happened in uh, 
the Renaissance, when this was actually like the inspiration piece actually made in the late 15th century, when this was made, multiple people were involved in it. So it's really fun to kind of see the way that fine scale miniature miniaturists are echoing even like the process of uh, like the, the workload distribution, if you will. Um, this is a space that was a study in the Renaissance. And this is what kind of what I love about it. It was a study, but also, and Becca, I'm gonna have you pause for just a moment here so I can talk a little bit about the space itself. Um, the, the space was a study for um, reflection. So the images are all about collecting and humanistic values and and, and talking about the ways in which the framework in which you should be thinking about the patron who is Federico de Montefeltro, um, a Duke in Urbino, Italy. And I like to think about this as like an Italian Renaissance man cave, honestly, because they're the walls that um, were designed by Barry Hipwell in our case were actually cupboards uh, that you would open up and you would have little treasures inside of them, uh, like tiny things. So it's kind of like the miniaturist version that we have today, but it's like the Italian Renaissance version of it. So I love that you come into the museum and you get this kind of uh, microcosm of what collecting is all about and the ways in which we think about that when you first walk in. It sets this great framework for walking through the rest of the space and thinking about the ways in which your collections say things about you. I love it. Uh, so we can keep going a bit here. Now, the paintings that you see up here, these Johannes Landman paintings are kind of great because he actually got to be a little bit creative when he did these. Uh, only two of what would have originally been seven paintings in this room are extant. And Becca, if you can pause again for a moment, I'm I'm waxing poetic about things that are going faster than the speed of the video, mm -hmm. uh, or I am going slower than the speed of the video. Uh, Darren, forgive me as I get no, excited no about them again. <laughs> uh, but he got to be creative here because um, again, only two of the paintings still exist. Uh, we had four of them up until World War II, and then they were in a museum in Berlin that was destroyed. Uh, and so he worked off of a couple of black and white photos and then he had two originals, but he actually got to kind of be creative and kind of think about, okay, well, what would the other one look like that is visible in this image, which is fantastic. Um, you can keep going, Becca. We'll scroll back up to the uh, wonderful coffered ceiling. Uh, wow. So you can see the detail that um, Ursula Derby Skopstad did with that. Uh, and that, I just, I love all of the gold reflection throughout the space. It just, it makes all of it feel special. So we all think about miniatures as these special objects and everything about this space is, is telling us that we really do need to value uh, the objects. I mean, isn't that, that is just an incredible, the detail, the level of detail here on the ceiling is just astounding. It's crazy. It's crazy. We did get a question of what what does the um what is being said along the wall? Do we know what the what it reads? So, yeah, that's a great question. So it's essentially in Latin is telling us, and Becca, if you could pause so I can talk about this image that's appearing here for just a second. Uh it is actually extolling the virtues of Federico de Montefeltro. It's telling everyone he's so great. And this was his private space. So the owner of this space, it's a proclamation of his awesomeness, more or less. And he would invite people into this space. Um, it was invitation only, and he would bring them in and they would see all of this great imagery. And then he would, uh, and you'll see like the walls are, they're trompe l'oeil, it's full of the eye. They're actually flat, but they look like they're open cupboard doors, which is so fun. And then, he would actually then open the cupboard doors and then take out the tiny objects. So these like multiple levels of shock and awe, if you will, uh, uh, in these spaces. And so it's really augmenting him, uh, which is also what's happening in this, uh, this um, cupboard image that we're looking at. Becca, you can restart the video scroll here because there's actually a parakeet uh, in a cage on that wall. I don't know if everyone can see it, like the cage um, markings on there. And that's something that Barbara actually switched. It's actually supposed to be on the opposite wall. 
but she loved that image so much, which is a marker of prestige again, because those, you couldn't get parakeets everywhere. So uh, it's kind of special that Federico de Montefeltro had one. And so we got to highlight that. And Barbara liked it so much that let's put it, let's make sure it's visible in the room. So I, I love that image too, because it kind of speaks to Barbara's relationship with the, with the artists. So, so just conceptually, was this Barbara Marshall's idea? Like, where did this come from that to do this? <laughs> well, I mean, as I understand it, this is, I mean, she would approach the artists and really ask them, and Amy can correct me for this particular one, but ask them if I'm wrong here, but ask them what they've wanted, always wanted to create and then um, provide them with the opportunity to really do that, uh, mm -hmm. which is, uh, just fantastic and then allow them the space and time to be able to kind of achieve the remarkable uh, works uh, many of which are in our collection today. Wow and I, I would imagine she had the artists in mind that she wanted to work on these pieces and and br brought them into the projects and I would imagine Johan would be the big piece of this. I don't know I don't know but well, I, it, actually uh, Bill Robertson is letting us know Barry um, Hipple is the one he wanted to do this room. And then it looks like Bill Robertson actually told Barbara about it. So uh, who's Barry? I'm sorry, I missed that. <laughs> Barry Hipwell, who did the uh the the wall in Tarsia. Uh, oh. Told Bill Robertson he was interested in doing it. So um and there's a comment too that the Met has a Renaissance room like this. Actually, the Met has this room today. It doesn't exist in Italy anymore. They literally took it out of the uh, plaza there and it's in New York today. Oh, wow. Oh my goodness, that's fabulous. Wow, okay, okay. <laughs> um, I can't I can't breathe. <laughs> oh, I know, it's remarkable. And every day I get to walk by it, it's thrilling. Does the Met know about this? I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. I, I would love to, for them to I know. I assume so, because as Bill Robertson is also telling us, they all the met, met in the Met. In the Met. Oh, 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 oh. So the agreement, oh. so. All right, okay. All right. Wow. That's great. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's fabulous. I know. I love it. It's just crazy. All right. And so speaking of, of things that contain things, we're going to look at another um, inspiration piece from medieval Renaissance times, but this little box that's on the second shelf from the bottom, it's called the Cassone. These were wedding chests. So you might think of them as like equivalent to dowry chests. Uh, but they were commissioned at the time someone would get married and they had painted imagery on it. Uh, this one was done by Natasha Beshenkovsky. Uh, and she did this in 1981. She did not do it for Barbara Mar Marshall. This was a later purchase. It was actually uh, a commission, a special work done for Carolyn Sunstein, who started uh, the Philadelphia Miniature Show and ran it for 20 years. And then the museum acquired it in 2010. So I kind of love it because you can see, one, you can see her initials are actually on the sides, the CS on the sides of the Cassone. And in the medieval and Renaissance times, those panels um, were where you would put like the couple that was getting married, their coats of arms would be on the side. So it's a really fun way to modernize it. And then it's also a really fun way for us to kind of continue to document the history of the miniature world as we acquire things that were important to different collectors too and kind of have a, a, a dialogue in place. And there you see Natasha's um, signature on the bottom, so great. Uh, and it also, um, even though we don't have it displayed open, uh, mm. it does even have the detail. I love this too, because you think about the, the fact that miniature artists do all the details in all the places, even if you can't see them. And so yeah. this is just a great example of that. We don't yeah. have it displayed with it open because otherwise you couldn't see the top of the chest, but that doesn't mean Natasha is not going to put all the elements like they would have been yeah. at the time of the inspiration piece. Love it, yeah. Wow, it's just awesome. Just awesome. Yeah, really. And again, that like level of detail. Now we're going to kind of swoop around here and you're going to see things that we're not going to stop and, and check out. We're not going into the French gallery. You're going to have to come and actually visit us in person uh, to to see the details of that. Or Darren will have to invite us back. I guess yeah, we'll see. For sure. Um, and I'm going to turn it back over to Amy to take us through what's um, known as the Masterpiece Gallery. Beautiful.
Right, so we're walking toward our Masterpiece Gallery, and this was designed to be kind of a combination of bank vault and jewelry store. And when the video gets into it, you'll see that it's very successful doing that. Uh, Barbara Marshall personally picked every piece that is in, in the Masterpiece Gallery. We're gonna only look at two pieces today. We had to make some choices. Mm -hmm. So the first one is this uh, Queen Anne style secretary made by Frank Early around 1924. Uh, as you're looking at this image, Becca, can you stop, pause for a minute? Let's use the word pause. Uh, there are pilasters that you can see in the um, top section. So there are some shorter ones below and a taller one above. And then there's an ivory uh, cabinet right there. And remember those because they'll be important for a photo that comes up in a minute. Becky, we could go on. The secretary was constructed of oak using only hand tools. Uh, veneered with pearled walnut mm. and features inlaid sunburst designs mm. and we'll see we'll see the sunburst design in ebony and holly at the bottom here the smallest inlaid pieces are five thousandths of an inch uh, the drawers are all dovetail jointed and the lock is functional the interior of the secretary is detailed in ivory, as you saw from that, that paused photo. But it, what I want to talk about now is it contained 19 secret compartments. So you would actually depress a latch on the base of the lower center pilaster, which would release it. And then two levers connected to weights unlatch the other lower pilasters, releasing in turn the three upper pilasters. So that's how those pieces came off. And then in the desk, desk section, the ivory trimmed cabinet had to be removed to reveal the hidden compartments. And that little ivory keystone at the top had to be lifted in order to be able to remove the cabinet. And then thread handles connected to a series of dovetailed boxes. And you'll see those all around the um, front of the photograph uh, and, and added adding everything together that's 19 secret compartments uh, for this piece and we wanted to also show you that in one of the compartments there were two hand-painted postcards that were discovered and they're here uh, with the piece oh my goodness that's just crazy so now we're going to look at a jardinere or art nouveau planter by linda laroche uh, it's based on a piece called flora marina flora exotica by emile gallet uh, the original full-size piece is exhibit was exhibited at the 1889 paris exposition and is now in the musée de l'école de nancy a museum founded in 1901 in northeastern france by gallet and other art nouveau um, artists uh, Madeline already mentioned this, but I'm going to tell you that Barbara Marshall, Marshall often commissioned work from artists, encouraging them to make the thing they had always wanted to make. And then she would, she would purchase that. She would support it. Um, this particular commission uh, was originally discussed in 1984. Uh, it was agreed upon in 1986. And Mrs. Marshall had it presented to her in 1998. So 14 years after the original discussion. Um, this plum wood casket is covered in marquetry and it fits together like a puzzle. All the colors are natural wood colors. LaRoche was drawn to this piece because of the Art Nouveau style, the asymmetric design, and that it was covered with fantastic and exotic plants and animals. <sighs> and we can just look and see some of the detail here. And when we get to the next photo, uh, look closely at the right side, and I'll tell you when. Um, right now, there's a piece of lead. So this was a planter, so it would have had to have been lead lined, so it would be watertight. And to do this, LaRoche cut empty paint tubes apart for the lead. Um, so really showing the inventiveness of miniature artists uh, to think about you know, what's really gonna work for their piece. We're seeing the rest of the the masterpiece gallery, uh, but we're going to keep going and 
uh, work our way toward in the artist studio, and I'm going to turn it over to Madeline again. So uh, the in the artist studio, which we're, we're approaching right now, is a space that was uh, designed and actually installed in the museum during the renovations in 2014, 15, after we heard back from visitors who, uh, especially those who had no experience prior to visiting us, uh, what is it like to make? How do you make these fine scale miniatures? What's the process? Um, what kind of tools do you use? And so this room is really intended as a space for learning and really thinking about how that how the things that are outside of the room how do they actually get made and so you can see different tools that are made and different processes for different parts of a lot of the elements um, and we had two artists uh bill robertson and then also leanne chellis wessel uh, do some demonstration videos and share some works with us and we're going to zoom in on some two of the uh works that leanne Ch chellis wessel uh, actually uh, did for us to show this process. So this is an egg tempera painting inspired by a Sandra Botticelli work uh, mm -hmm. that um, because it's done with egg tempera, so you're mixing your pigments with egg yolk, there's a particular process. And I kind of like love this as we kind of scroll across this because what you're going to see is that the base of the skin tone is actually green. It's terra verde. And uh, it's so fascinating uh, to me. I love that she shows this process of layering because this is what they would do in the Renaissance, especially to get the skin tones the way that they wanted them to. But if you go to um, an art museum today and walk through the Renaissance galleries, some of the figures look sickly because the paint has worn away and, and changed a bit. And it's because of this, it's because of the process. And so this is just a fantastic display that really shows that process and like why it looks like that, right? Uh, and then she also did um, these Myolica uh, dishes, a series of them to show you how these are decorated. And these were precious objects. The inspiration behind them are these precious objects that were very dominant in the Italian Renaissance as a process and way of, of display. And you would do all of these layers of decoration um, on this white surface to try to get these vibrant colors and that's what they were really drawn to were these vibrant colors and they might do historical scenes they might do decorative designs they might write put their family heraldic arms on these and they're so uh immersive like i like to think about I like to think about, even though we don't let people touch the miniatures, I like to think about the, you know, like you see in the video, uh, Leanne actually like holding the objects, right? And, and thinking about the, the scale and the actual tactile quality of them. In uh, the Renaissance, these would have been passed around at elaborate dinners and you imagine them like filled with food uh, and that they aren't actually, the imagery isn't actually revealed until the, the diners have actually scooped the food out, take it out. So it's like that process again of the image changes as you actually engage with it. And that's what I really love. It's not just this thing that sits there on the wall or on a shelf. It's an object that, I, that can really come to life when you understand uh, more about it and also understand more about the processes that are involved in the miniature um, artist's hand um, as they're as they're learning how their inspiration pieces were made and used. Yeah. Um, we're gonna kind of just tuck in here and just take a quick look at our micro micro curiosities uh, section um, and uh, not really go in there. It's another enticement. Come and see us if you want to. Uh, see more of that. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Amy um, to actually take us through uh, new acquisitions. Beautiful. Yeah, so this is our new acquisitions case. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the museum's collecting. So Barbara Marshall did all of our collecting until she retired in 2010. And the museum didn't really actively purchase much between 2010 and 2017. But at that point, we had Miniature Masterworks. Mm -hmm. uh, some of you might know about it. I know Darren attended. I had been at the museum for six weeks, uh, so I was there. Uh, we are going to do it again in 2024, uh, September of 2024. Um, when we collect, we try to collect miniatures that we think Barbara Marshall would have wanted to collect when she was doing so. 
So I'm gonna talk about two artists. This first piece is a Sailor's Valentine entitled Two Hearts by Peter Gable. Uh, this work was acquired in at Miniature Masterworks in 2017 and was the first work by Peter that entered the collection. Uh, he specializes in working with shells. And for this piece, he provided us with two legends to show what the individual shells are. And you might ask why two legends? Well, there's so many shells in this, so many different shells that there's a legend for the inner circle and there's a legend for the outer uh, rim area. So the, the center has two heart cockles uh, with three star sands and they're framed by an abalone veneer with a circle of mongo snail shells. Um, and then we're going to, after we get a really good look at this, we're going to zoom out and see the outer ring, which includes uh, eight half moons. The dark blue half moons are cerithium shells. The lighter green are made from knobby green sea urchin spines. Next to that are orange cone shells. And the final, or half, final half moons are turbo shells. Uh, so those are ones that are kind of white and, white and brown. Uh, the brown pieces that you can see between the half moons are brown scallops. You mean uh, and the size of this piece? This is 112. And I did see a picture about that or a question about that earlier. But Pretty much everything we're showing is 112 unless we say it's not. And and just, I mean, I didn't see it in scaled up. Is it, how big is it, it, it in just in real life? It's about two and a half inches. Two and a half inches. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's quite That includes the shell on the outside? Yes, that, that, that includes, yeah, it's all in... Um, that wood case. Is the wood case two and a half inches or the whole piece? The wood case. Oh, my, okay, got it, thank you. Yeah. Wow, wow. Um, so we're now looking at back at our new acquisitions case. And again, you can see all these wonderful things that we've acquired, but unfortunately we don't have time to talk about all of them. So I'm going to talk about uh, this Paola low board that's going to come up now. This mid-century modern low board was by was made of teak by artist Fernando Setien, and we first encountered him in Chicago in 2018. Uh, this is based on a 1959 design by Belgian artist Oswald Bermeck. Uh, in 1959, Princess Rufo de Calabria married Prince Albert of Belgium, and she became Queen Paola. And so that's uh, this piece, the Paola low board was built uh, to honor that new queen of Belgium. In order to, re to uh, use properly sized wood grain, uh, Setien actually makes his own wood panels uh, that he then uses for all, to build all of his furniture. Uh, Fernando Setien entered or started working in miniatures after Barbara Marshall's retirement in 2010. So this is the first work that TM acquired for the collection. Beautiful. But you can see how, you know, it displays all these very obvious mid-century modern uh, features like the tapered legs. And then uh, Becca, when she did the video, wanted to show you this third window. And unfortunately, I'm not talking about anything in there, but it does have a wonderful piece about by Althea Chrome and several other uh, wonderful pieces you'll need to come and see. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to um, go to the American Architects Classroom by Bill Robertson. Uh, this is circa 1900. He finished it in 1993. Wow. This is what ushers visitors into our miniature maze. And I've shown this to architects and even those that weren't in school in 1900 uh, just are mesmerized by this piece. It, it just reminds them so much of their own architecture classrooms. Uh, Bill used catalogs of the period to design the furnishings and everything is of course functional. You can see this room from two sides and what's gonna come into view on the right side is a circa 1906 blueprint maker with automatic washing box and drying rack. And it's by the window because it would be on a track that the, the, it could be put into the sunlight through the open window and that would develop the print. Um, just like a functional full-size architect's classroom, there are a series of architectural models on the far side of the room. And some of the framed architectural prints 
are original hand-colored steel lithographs from the 1850s. Others are reproductions, but, but Bill framed and glazed them all. He made all but three pieces in this room, two chairs and a tiny Victorian house. Uh, everything else is Bill Robertson. Uh, if you looked up, and I may have uh, not allowed you to see that scene, Becca, can you go back just a tiny bit to the overall image? Right there. If you look up, this house or this room has its very own sprinkler system, which is designed after the um, Frederick Grinnell patent of 1892-93. Uh, and you can keep going, Becca. Thank you. So Bill Robertson's fondness for antique tools is quite evident as you look through this room. Um, and we're going to be kind of scanning around the room, but we're gonna to go to one of the pieces that I, there are so many wonderful features, but one of the things that I really enjoy are that there are three wire mesh waste baskets that you can see here. They contain, each one contains 1,020 solder joints and they're even filled with paper, with scrap paper. <laughs> we're gonna leave the architect's classroom because we're doing this quickly and go to the William Martin House breakfast room. I guess we're still in the architect's classroom. Here we go. So Alice, artists Allison Ashby and Steve Jed created this 112 scale replica of the breakfast room of the William Martin House in Chicago. Um, they were the first artists when I arrived at the museum five years ago who described to me this process of, you know, we met Barbara Marshall in Chicago. She loved our work and she asked us to, to make a piece and they didn't know what piece to make. She had purchased another piece from them, uh, but they didn't know what piece to make. So Steve was actually a carpenter and he was hired to do some work on the full size William Martin house and walked into the breakfast room and just knew this was the piece that they were gonna do for the museum. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright is no, well known for designing everything in his rooms, so the room and the furnishings. And Ashby and Jed included all of these details uh -huh. in this really engaging miniature room. Uh -huh. Oh my and God. And we're backing out of this room now and we're gonna look across the hall, the, the miniature maze at our final piece. This is the Art Deco Jewelry Store. And we're making this the final piece because this was the last commission made by Barbara Marshall. It's mm. by Kevin Mulvaney and Susie Rogers. And they did an interesting thing. They turned the question around on Barbara Marshall of what they had always wanted to make and said, what have you always wanted to have? And she said a jewelry store. And there was a very specific uh, two large but somewhat narrow space and so they made a two-story structure there are several architectural um, Ill, uh, inspirations for this piece the ocean liner normandy the uh, netherland plaza hotel in cincinnati and neiman marcus store in chicago uh, the chrysler building in new york city uh, the elevate the interior of the elevators are based on that Mulvaney and Rogers worked with several other artists to create this grand room. And uh, very soon we will see the chandelier, which was beaded by, there it is right there, by British artist, Robert Ward. And this includes 15,800 beads. We haven't counted them. We took the word of the artists on that one. Uh, and then there are three figures in the room <clears throat> made of porcelain by Maria Jose Santos of Spain. Uh, a shopkeeper displays a ruby necklace to a woman in a stylish green suit with a fur stole. And the gentleman accompanying her actually holds a newspaper with the headline, Lindbergh Does It. Mm -hmm. When Maria Jose Santos learned that Mulvaney and Rogers wanted the room to be lit at twilight, she added a five o'clock shadow to the men's cheeks. Uh -huh. So every little detail uh, has so much attention that's paid to it. And then finally, we're gonna look at the jewelry in the room. This was made by Canadian artist, Lori Ann Potts. Uh, and what you see is an octagonal, octagonal counter with about 45 pieces of jewelry, 
all made with precious and semi-precious stones. So we're gonna stop here. We've given you this, this view and now we wanna give you time to ask questions. Oh my goodness, that's just crazy. I do have a question actually about, you, you mentioned um, that now that Barbara Marshall is no longer with us, but you are now, you know, acquiring pieces, you think about what she would have chosen. What are some of the things that you think about when you think about her and choosing what to bring in? Well, we have per definitely purchased some things from artists that she collected from. So we, we know for sure that she was a big fan of their work, but we're really looking, everything we collect, we um, are supposed to be considering what is the quality of someone who's a member of IGMA, uh -huh. uh, the International Guild of Miniature Artisans. And so we're looking at, for that kind of very top quality of fine scale miniature. We also are very lucky. We have a collections committee that includes uh, family members of our co-founders and Margaret Silva, who is Barbara Marshall's daughter is the chair of that committee. Mm -hmm. And so when I get Barbara to say, yes, yes, Amy, then I know that, that we've really like done the right thing and, and chosen the right works. Awesome, awesome. All right, let's see if there's any other questions. Um, if your museum is burgled, it was me, Faith Miller. Faith Miller. Um, oh, let's see, do you guys have any other questions? Lots of kudos to Bill Robertson, of course. Yes. Um, and I, I guess I had another question. So that, that new acquisitions portion that I don't want to call it box or, or case off, case does that does that get turned over and how often that's a great question it's uh right now it has pieces from 2017 through 2019 uh but it hasn't been changed in uh in a couple of years covid kind of affected a lot of things uh but we are getting ready to change it to a new to a new set of objects those that were acquired from 2019 through this year actually 2022 because we did go to chicago this year and acquire some pieces um, so I'm not sure quite of the timing, but it'll probably be within the next three to four months. It will okay. change. So awesome. you need to rush in if you want to see those pieces. In that case, we'll try to incorporate some of those pieces throughout the uh, rest of the miniature galleries. Okay. Um, I'm going to have one more question. Well, no, let's take one from, from folks. Uh, Barry wants to know how many houses do you have at the museum and what is the oldest? It's a good question. Oh gosh, Bill's still on the call. Maybe he can help with that answer. How many houses? I'm thinking that that there are about um, somewhere between 10 and 12 that were on exhibit that are actually houses. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how many in the collection. We have about 48% of our collection on display. And a lot of the larger scale pieces are, but I can think of at least one or two that are not on display. We also have miniature rooms mm. uh, and we have a lot more of those than we have houses. Um, right. The oldest piece, mm. that's, uh, I haven't, has Bill answered that question? Cause he may uh, know, I'm afraid I don't know. He did answer, answer the question about how many houses we have. He just said lots. <laughs> lots. <laughs> Good answer. Um, so wow. we do, I, I actually will, I will share something I wasn't going to share. We did actually just acquire a thorn room from the first set. We're hearing uh, it just here now. <laughs> and the reason yeah. I wasn't going to announce it is, I'm sorry, it's not on display yet, but we are going to be right. undergoing some renovations um, over the next year. And so it should be on display uh, by the summer of 2023. Uh, and we had this, uh, when it came up, uh, in Chicago, we had it thoroughly researched by McCann Morgan, who used to be at the Art Institute. Yeah. And we, this how it's the um, English Cotswold Cottage from the first set. And uh, it was exhibited by IBM was the last time we were aware it was exhibited in the 1940s. It's in a 1946 catalog. And then it didn't show up again until 2019 when it showed up in a North Shore estate. So it probably is the oldest, oldest room that we have in the collection, um, but it's just not on display quite yet. And that'll be your first thorn room in, that you've- Absolutely, it'll be our th first thorn room. Wow. Uh, sets two and three are at the Art Institute of Chicago. 
set one is split between the Phoenix Museum of Art and uh, Knoxville, right. Tennessee. Um, and it was thought that a lot of the other room, most of the other rooms were uh, no longer extant, that they had been deconstructed. And so it was quite the surprise to find this room. Wow. Uh, and we feel really, really lucky that um, we were able to acquire it. Wow. And when do you think it'll be uh, on display? Summer of 2023. 2023. Okay. It's I mean, take I take a bit here, but I mean, I think that's a great goal because that's when, when is Miniature Masterworks also 2023? It's in September of 2024. So we'll okay. be there in plenty of time. It's actually going to be on display close to our history of miniatures case. So it involves some, some significant construction um, yeah. into basically taking up part of a cleaning closet um to make it fit in it's in the place where it's going to be best interpreted oh my god well that's but, great great information yeah and i was just gonna just jump in quick and just um encourage everyone to follow us on social media because we will be keeping everyone updated uh minute to minute as to when that is actually going to be on view so that's a great way to know exactly when to time your trip for sure and you know this has just been a a taste of everything that you guys have, the extraordinary museum with an extraordinary collection. I just want to thank you guys so much for giving us this wonderful tour and giving us the inspiration to put it on our calendars to visit often <laughs> because you need to spend a lot of time to look at all these wonderful treasures. So thank you, Amy. Thank you, Dr. Rislow. Thank you, Becca, behind the scenes. Thank you all at home for watching and participating in your questions. and. Guys, this has been just an extraordinary treat. Thank you so much. I want to say thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. And thank you for joining this very special Meet the Miniaturist. Guys, take care.